Hello and welcome to GG Weekend Watch with myself, Dave Young. And this week I'm joined by Andrew Mount and Matty Sutcliffe. It's the boys on tour this particular week. We've got nine races on ITV that we'll be covering. Haydock, Ascot and then the Morgianas thrown in from Punchestown. Last week was, of course, Cheltenham. There was a good three-day meeting there. Andrew told us that Lodacid would win the Arkle Novices Trial. And myself and Andrew both liked the look of Hamsian, who was well-supported and won quite nicely too. So it is decent racing this weekend, but more importantly, it is the first British grade one of the season at Haydock in the Betfair chase. Will he or won't he for Grey Dawning? We'll find out a little bit later on from both the boys. It's also a nice time to remind you guys out there that are watching this that most of you aren't subscribed to the channel. So if you've got a YouTube account and you can subscribe, please do so. If not, then just drop a like and drop a comment because we like seeing your interactions. But we're going to crack on. There's nine of these races to get through. It's decent action. It's not just the grade one Betfair chase that we've got. We've got the grade one Morgiana as well. There's a couple of grade twos. There's a graduation chase. There's four juicy looking handicaps. This is right the right kind of stuff for both Matty and Andrew to get stuck into. So we kick off in the first at Haydock. It's the 115 handicap hurdle over two miles, three furlongs. At the moment, we have got Beat the Bat top in the market. He's a nine to two top price. Steel Alley's in second at six to one. Kamsanas is next in at 13 to two, followed by Silver Trophy winner, Josh the Boss. Look, this looks a pretty deep race to get started with, Andrew. There's 15 runners going to post. We've got quite a few extended places up for grabs at the moment. And they may extend even further as it goes on. But will you need to use them or do you think you've got the winner? Um, I'm going to have to back Josh the Boss, I think, given the form of that Chepstow race worked out incredibly well. 11 horses have run since, um, five one at the next time of asking, two seconds, two fourths, a ninth and a pulled up. Some of those horses have run more than twi uh, more, uh, twice or more since that race. You know, Active Authority, for example, won his next two. So I think in, in total, it's thrown up something like seven or eight subsequent winners, a whole lot of places. You know, the time was fast and not only did Josh the Boss win, he did so in comfortable fashion by four lengths. Uh, from Doyen Quest, of course, in second. We'll hear more about him later on. So uh, I thought once it was confirmed that he was definitely running, he's shortened up. But he's around about 7 to 1, 15 to 2, maybe because the ground's potentially going to be very soft. Well, we should talk about the ground at Haydock. Um, some of the forecasts are saying it's going to be biblical rain between now and post time. You know, we could be in the sort of heavy water locked in places, only just surviving an inspection kind of going. Um, but so, yeah, well, I've sort of worked to soft ground, even heavy ground preference into my selections today. So I'll back Josh the boss. Wasn't quite so keen on. Um, you know, beat the bat after the absence. He's been off the track for 344 days, particularly if it does get testing. Still allies, got the sort of um, front running style you don't mind at Haydock, but he's uh, he's only won once from nine starts. Um, Cam Camsinus is well near the head of the betting, but he's never backed up a win. No wins from four starts, immediately following a win. Third, second, sixth, and a nowhere. And I thought Punta del Este might have been flattered by that third at Carlisle last time when widest of all. If you're not familiar with Carlisle hurdles form this season, if you're not wide on the track, you haven't got a prayer. The bias is so obvious that even some of the jockeys noticed it by the uh, the last race of the last meeting. Um, the one um, I will back each way, though, is Knight of Alain for Jane Williams. Um, I was sort of discussing potential targets with uh, Chester Williams, Jane Williams' son for this horse a few weeks ago. And I mean, the Great Wood hurdle was you know, mooted as a possibility, um, but it's more likely going to be uh, with the Lanzarote at Kempton in February and uh, this as a stepping stone to, uh, to that race. And uh, he really caught the eye at Haydock on his, on his comeback when he needed the run, not given a hard time. He finished third to uh, the unbeaten Wade House. Uh, and I thought he's, you know, he's going to take some beating off a mark of 120. Um, so, uh, last year's winner, Park, uh, enunciated is, is sort of quite interesting coming back to hurdles from fences. But I'll go Knight of Allen each way and I'll save on Josh the boss because of that Chepstow form. Oh, I like it. Plenty for Andrew to talk about in there, Matty. It is a pretty deep race. Touched on Camtonas last time out winner, not being so good next time out. He was weak as anything in the market. Bowen's Park was really strong in that particular race, got a first time visor on an air. Beat the Bats got that Dysar Enos form, which actually looks all right now from the Great Wood. And obviously, Josh the Boss have touched on him, recent winner in the Silby Trophy at Chepstow. It's a real deep race to get us off to the start. Where do you see it? Yeah, uh, good to be back. Uh, I think Andrew's covered it really well. Uh, it's a lovely race to start off proceedings. And um, 
what feels like the proper the proper start of national hunt race now we've got the rain back it's a lovely card um as andrew mentioned last year's winner park on Seattle returns are only two pound higher but he's got to bounce back from a fairly heavy fall at air last month um i thought still ally was potentially interesting off top weight having basically set the uh, well champion head up for his stable mate lumps on there from the front last time out but uh, going up three pounds so that was a bit harsh i thought from the handicapper um particularly given the winner only went up seven and the second remained on the same mark um, my only concern with Steel Ally is most of the winners of um, this race generally come from midfield or tend to, be, tend to be held up. So given that Joshua Boss might go forward and Golo is probably going to go forward as well, uh, they'll force a pace and it could set up um, one of those from the rear. So I've gone for two from the rear. Uh, the first is the one that uh, Andrew mentioned is Ponte del Este for uh, the Skeletons. And um, I know you mentioned the uh, the wide bias, but um, he was only beaten three and a quarter length off top weight um, in that class two at Carlisle giving £11 and £26 a pair ahead of him. And it's probably unlucky not to finish a touch closer as well. Um, of those to race in rear there as well, Johnny, uh, the horse in fifth was beating uh, 10 lengths. The horse in eighth was beating 20, uh, 22 lengths as well. So you can probably upgrade that form on um, account of his track bias. Given he's a course and distance winner, proved on heavy ground, uh, which is probably like a bit soft or heavy at least. Uh, is one I'm keen on, fairly keen on the prices. Now, the other is uh, the ranker, the other side of the uh, the market, I've actually put Don Zavon up in my column. Uh, 50 to 1 and uh, i thought it'd get snipped in and he's already gone out to 66 to 1 which tells you um it's quite ironic for value column isn't it um he's a horse that'd be waiting back for a long time now and um, since he fell at the first uh entry in the group three two years ago he was laid out for that race having finished second date last season before and then um, i presume he's just been tricky to get fit i mean he's okay he had a pipe over and over an inadequate two miles last time out at chepstow and i did think that go for a three mile race later on in the card the uh, stairs handicap hurdle and uh, that he won two years ago but I don't think um, surplus of stamina on this heavy ground, I think, will suit him. And I just think that if the handbrake is off, he's a very well handicapped to a horse to go well for a yard has won this twice in the last decade. Ooh, 66 to 1 outsider for Matty at the time of recording, but as he's alluded to, it's on the drift. He might even be bigger than that by the time you watch this. And um, Punta del Este as well has given a strong mention, and it was Knight of Adam for Andrew with a potential saver, or I say potential, a saver probably on Josh the boss. Right, that was a deep race to get into. I'm glad you boys have managed to cipher it down to four of the field anyway. Next, Next. race we come to is the 130 Ascot, the first graded race on, uh, of action on ITV. Pick Dory is a very, very warm order to retain his title in this. Of course, Shishkin 12 months ago refused to race, seems even longer ago than 12 months. But Pick Dory's a one to two poke. Dashwood Drash is next in the bet, betting at nine to two, the 11 year old getting six pounds for him. Le Patron's in here, Matt, he's tipped him up in the past. Phlegmatic's in here, I've tipped him up in the past. And Hidden Depths, not sure if anyone's tipped him up, but he's in the race anyway. We've had some real good winners of this one, but Matty, surely this doesn't take very long to go through. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned the old uh, the old trumpet on the Patreon, the, uh, the infamous double of Not So Sleep as well. Was it the uh, Henry VIII uh, card, wasn't it? Sundown. And, uh, so I appreciate that one. Um, yeah, Pick Dory. It's interesting that Cobden's come here to ride, uh, I presume to ride Pick Dory, or the, um, the Brave Man's Games in the Betfair Chase. Uh, which probably speaks volumes about both horses. Um, he's course for him since, uh, since his win up in 2020 as well. All offences, three wins in a second. His form in grade two chases, four wins, a fall and a second. And his record on seasonal debut as well, two, uh, three wins in a second. He does seem to have everything going for him. My only slight concern would be if the ground does come up soft. I don't think it'll be as soft as Haydock. I mean, it never really is, is it? But um, if it does come up soft, I just wonder whether it might be short enough at, um, at one to two. Um, I think all his forms come on better ground. And I do think that with Dassel Dresser having just £3 to find with him, we know that he likes to um, be going soft ground. And I think Dassel Dresser might be the one in, uh, to play in here. Um, I know that he's, they've kind of kept him over, over hurdles to try and dominate, well, what's been a weak week three-mile division, hasn't it? Um, but I just think they should have sent him chasing last season. He's far from 11 over fences. You know, he loves he loves his soft ground. Um, he's two from three when completing in graded chase as well. And he won that um, the race that Pit Doyle won last year, the uh, the Grade One Ascot Chase. He won that a few years ago. Was an RPR of eight pounds higher than Pit Dory. So if it if he does, it, you know, if the buff, I just think at the prices, Dashwood Dresser from the front, if he goes. And the only my only slight issue, I don't think Jeremy's had a, Jeremy Scott's had a winner for his 124 days, I think it is, and then um, which doesn't particularly bode well for Golden Ace later on. But um, he goes well fresh. He's never been out of the first three on on air season real uh, return. So if Dasha Drasher is prime for this uh, back home offence, I think he's the, uh, the one to be on. Oh, I like it. Andrew, do you still give 11-year-old Dasha Drasher the same respect that Matty clearly does? 
No, he hasn't raced over fences for two years. Um, although he's won twice here, he jumped Mark out to his left on each occasion. The last couple of times he's run here, he's got beat. You know, he's a fantastic horse, but uh, like the worries with the stable form, I don't think nine to two is uh, particularly enticing. The Patron, I wasn't usually keen on the third favourite. Hidden Depths, I didn't like the 50 to one shot. I just came down to the two runners, the, the other two runners, the Long Gods on favourite, Pick Dory, last year's winner. Uh, and phlegmatic. Now, I know phlegmatic bonded out on his comeback, uh, but he does love going this way around. It is of his nine highest racing post ratings, five have come at Kempton, where he will be worth the bet that next time he turns up. But I'd love to see him running the King George because he'd be about 100 to 1 and probably be in the first three or four. Uh, but his other you know, his other four highest RPRs away from Kempton came here at Ascot. So it's just a, you, you know what Dan Skelton's like when he runs these this type of horse in this race with a bit like with unexpected party, you just pot hunting, you know. Uh, you you get two grand for finishing fifth. If he can get second, it's seventeen thousand quid. You know, he's gonna be hunted round and uh, you know, hopefully he can just sneak through, finish second to pick Dory. So I think I'll do you know, pick Dory phlegmatic. Um, forecast phlegmatic without the favourite, something like that. Even each way, 33 to 1, you're getting eight and a quarter to 1 the place. That wouldn't be the worst bet in the world. So I'll, I'll just take a flyer on phlegmatic to run some sort of race here. Fair enough. And obviously, different ways to play it. We've got five runners at the moment. So it could go down to a win only thing. But like Andrew said, there will be without markets in there. Phlegmatic for Andrew, Dashiell Drasher for Matty. Now we're back to Haydock. It's the graduation chase. In and around the same distance, a half a furlong further here, you'd think these could be the same sort of types that would be winning 1965 chases going down the line. We've had Grey Dawn in that slammed Gayard de Mesnil in this race last year, despite making a couple of er erroneous jumps. Hitman won this in the past. I think that's maybe the last time Hitman's ever won a race. Brave Man's game dotted up in here, so it's another one for Paul Nichols. Master Tommy Tucker for Paul Nichols. He's got even further back. He's got Klanders, Obo, Politolog, Silsol, Virac. It's a race that he's particularly farmed. But this year round, we've got Iroko for Oliver Greenall and Josh Guerrero. Was supposed to miss last season. They said he was out for the season. Came back for Cheltenham and came back for Aintree. A couple of decent runs. He's instilled as the 7-4 to favourite for this. He's got Trelawney behind at 7-2. to Tamaris for Paul Nichols, 5-1. to Hillcrest making a comeback from 981 days at 11-2. to It's definitely in silence at 12-1 to for the Skelton's team that won this last year. And then it's 100-1 to Pope, the rank outsider at the bottom of it. Andrew, this looks like a pretty decent race i suppose the market suggests that iroko should just win this but do you see it panning out like that yeah it is a very very interesting race um it, it was one of those ones where you, i couldn't really um you know sort of pick too many holes in the form of the favorite you know given that good record first time out was it three wins from three starts i think since uh since joining this yard trelawn as well is three from three on his seasonal debuts so well, no, with Oroco, signal debut runs for this yard, two wins and a 33 to 1 fourth in grade one company. So Trelawne as well, three from three first time out. Both of them go extremely well when fresh. Um, Tamoris has been off the track for 273 days. And basically, as a general rule with Nichols horses, since the 1st of October, anything been off the track for 150 days or longer is underperforming. Even though he's had some winners, that's something we should have mentioned with Pick Dory as well. They're basically running at a much lower than expected uh, win rate, whereas those who've had a race within the last five weeks, like Il Rodoto had before winning at um, uh, Cheltenham last week, they're taking a big step forward. So I'm very wary of anything that Nichol first time out Nichols runners at the moment. So uh, I'll uh, I'll avoid tomorrow. So I, I, it's probably going to be a Rocco and Trelawn fighting it out. Hillcraft is fascinating after that 981 day absence, but you know he's certainly entitled to improve the run. The other one that was half interesting was Deafening Silence. So Dan Scales only had nine runners in Graduation Chase Company previously. Two of those won. Um, several others finished in the frame. And uh, only one of those was making its chase debut. And um, that was one who um, jumped like a hairy dog, but then won second time out at, uh, at 12 to 1. So do keep an eye on, on deafening silence after the 351-day break. Possibly not for this run, uh, but maybe next time. But I'll, of the two, I'll go Trelawne because of that 100% record first time out and the fact that he's um, twice the price of Iroka. But I think it's between the two. Nice, Matt. It seems fairly straightforward to Andrew then, looking towards the head of the market, but going for the second favourite, Trelawne, with that impeccable first time out record. How did you see this? Yeah, it's one that I think we shouldn't overcomplicate, isn't it? Um, if a Roka brings that, that entry forward, I'd be, um, I know the way you're thinking, the Kim Yo winner. If he brings that form, he's, 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 he'd be tough to beat, I think. He's clear on ratings. 
Um, I mean, I won't be getting stuck at the crisis, but I think he just the the obvious winner. Obviously, Paul Nichols won this race seven the last ten renewals, so Tomeris has to be of interest. And I know that it, it was a lot better on the cheap piece he went on. It's just a, a bit dog-like. I'd question his attitude, and um, he'd have had to strengthen up some serious amount from from last season where just still really raw. Um, Trelawn's an interesting one. I think I just think he might be mining for the Ultima again. I think wasn't he sent off five to one for that? Um, I think he fell at second as well. So I just imagine that they might mine his mark for that. Hillcrest, you say, Hillcrest could be absolutely anything, couldn't it? The archetypal, anything he does over hurdles in a bonus, just, I think he's 18 hands, isn't it? Um, it's just so hard to get get fit, but he has been entered quite in quite a few races, and um, which suggests that they are quite keen to get him out. He was entered at the in the novice shares that you talked to on Sunday. So the fact that they come for this instead suggests that they are keen to, uh, keen to get him going. Um, as Andrew mentioned, definitely silence is one that I've been um, looking forward to going over a fence. Uh, he beat that Cine nominally in um in a point about three years ago. I know you can't call out the form now, but um ever since then that that Cine nominee won the Fox Hunters last season, didn't it? He's been prolific in points. And um, he's always been a chaser, he loves bottomless ground. And um just wonder whether the first time out will, will be this will be the target. Um but yeah, I just think we shouldn't overcomplicate it and uh, stick with Oroco. I like it. We've gone around about it, but hopefully Oroco does fulfil the promise that he's shown last season and obviously like i said had that setback still came back in the spring maybe he's even better than we've seen today we're going to find out on saturday right speaking of finding out on saturday we've got punches towns morgiana the grade one coming at 210 over two miles and half a furlong state man has won this the last twice hurricane fly is the last horse to win this three times in a row for that man willie mullins speaking of willie mullins he's won i think i say nine of the last ten i think he's won maybe 11 of the last 12 it's only abracadabras in 2020 who took the scalp of san Juan. but he's got some depth in here lossy mouse one in two brighter days are heads in here for gordon elliott there's a load more for willie mullins in behind but it really does look like it's a clash between the top three in the market Stateman's currently five to six lossy mouse 11 to four and it's five to one for brighter days ahead so matty this looks Again, I feel almost like the Pick Dory race. This should be relatively straightforward. State man's won it the last twice. State man's the highest rated. I know he's got to give some money, to, some uh, weight to the ladies, but State man just wins, does he? Yeah, he's he's a funny old horse, isn't he? He's a ten-time Group One winner. And it's, yeah, we just don't seem to respect him at all. I mean, if Constitution Hill wasn't around, and well, maybe maybe it won't be around anymore. And um, it just it'd be widely regarded as the best hurdler of his generation. Certainly, certainly my generation, anyways. And um, it's just because he's not a flashy horse. He doesn't beat his rivals by 10, 20 lengths. He just grinds them down and he always gets the job done. And um, so the obvious, the obvious one is State Man. Um, if there is a bet to be had in here, I'd probably he'd go under two lengths State Man, maybe. Or the forecast with her brighter days ahead. She's got the fitness on the side. And um, she's only £3 worse off and lost him, I think. So that'll be negative at that. And, um, but yeah, just keep it simple. State Man to win. I like it. Andrew, is it that straightforward for you two? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, state state man wins, I think. So uh, it's a yeah, a little, little bit of a shame that we're sort of uh, talking about a race being a match, and uh, they're both from the same yard. But uh, you know, I, I love state man, and uh, like you say, despite the fact being a multiple grade one winner, he hasn't got the credit he uh, he deserves. I think he'll take the beating here, so he'll do for me. I like it. We can keep that one short and sweet. And it's, I still think it's staggering. I know he'll be turning eight, but he's still only seven turning eight. He's got a couple of seasons left in him, isn't he? And he's already amounted so many wins up to now. It'll be a great clash to see. It'll be good to see how the girls fare. But more interestingly is the Stairs Handicap Hurdle back in Haydock. 2.30. This is over three miles and half a furlong. This sees Doyen Quest, who won last weekend at the Cheltenham meet in run again. He's got £5 penalty, but he went up £10, so technically he's £5 went in. He's one of three horses that are last time out winners for Dan Skelton. and they've got Captain Derry, they've got Gwenny May Boy. We've got Shoot First, that was favourite for a attempt a couple of years ago for Charles Burns. He had a comeback run recently after a massive layoff. And then back Masak me, I think I've said that right, for Emmett Mullins and Donna Myler, who won the race last year. Um, with the late slate lane Look, it's, a, it's a race that's had some good winners in the past paisley parks won this sam spinners won this and there's quite a bit of depth in here i think andrew so have you had any joy in trying to filter this one down and finding the winner yeah um that's why it's quite interesting since they run out of the proper hurdles instead of six brush ones with sam spinner winning in 2017 uh, six of the seven winners were fertile second last time i had raced within the last six weeks that should really be seven from seven but uh crambo was given a shocking ride when third in the race last year that's probably me talking through my wallet 
Um, so, you know, there's plenty qualifying on that angle, Doyen Quest. But will he um, like the ground if it does turn genuinely soft or heavy, which is certainly possible? Uh, you know, catch him, Derry's three from four, or second in the other since switched to um, Handicap Company. He was a winner 24 days ago. But I'm going to I'm going to sort of go against those stats and, and put, put up one that I've been backing since last weekend at sort of 33 to 1 and downwards, which is patriotic for Evan Williams, who came out of the Josh the Boss um, Silver Trophy race at Chepstow, the one I talked about earlier on that's worked out so well. Uh, five of the 11 runners won their next start, a couple of seconds. Some of them have won twice since then. Now, he was a real eye-catcher in that race. He was a 14-1 to one shot under Isabel Williams, and it was a case of sort of off the pace, crept into it, never near to challenge. Typical Evan Williams comeback run, you think, with a bigger target in mind. Um, now, he's, he's never won in a uh, big field, but he was second 14, big three quarters of length. Uh, um, Foss last on his penultimate start. That was over 2 6, where he was staying on well at the business end. That Chepstow race was two miles, three and a half. I thought stepping back up to, um, well, stepping up to three miles for the first time would suit. He's around about 14 to 1 best now. With all those enhanced place terms, I just thought uh, each way. He was going to be, you know, finishing to good effect and should be in, in the first two or three. You go through his career, uh, but for a fall, he's never been out of from the first three, apart from that comeback run at Chepstow, which was probably his best run ever, you know, finishing fifth of 17. So I'll go for patriotic, patriotic, however you want to say it. Um, I'll be uh, screaming the place down if this wins. I like it. So as you mentioned, it has been well supported. Top price, 14 to 1 at the time of recording, a general 12 to 1 poke. But there are five places up for grabs. I say with this being a 16 runner handicap, it should only be four places, shouldn't it? But we know what I'm like week in, week out, asking the bookies to play 16 places when there's 16 runners. Matty, it, like it's interesting, Andrew, touching on there with the, with the fact that the ground could change. Dorian Quest was a good winner, is £5 well in. People are looking at the front of the market and think maybe he's a good thing. But the Skeltons have obviously put a couple in behind as well. So maybe confidence isn't as strong as it could be but like i say charles burns has got shoot first back um back massacre me i don't know why i've said that one again it was too hard the first time but it's obviously interesting for connections from last year it does look quite a deep race so where did your pin fall in this one yeah well i was i was wondering where the 33s about patriotic when i was going to put him off my column this morning i realized andrew's taking it all hmm. couldn't believe it and then um, yeah so this is the race that i was hoping don savant was going to go for um but since when I realised they, they were taking Patrick instead, I have to focus on that one. And then, as Andrew said, like he was such an eye catch from that silver trophy at Chepstow coming from the rear. The only other one to come from rear was Diane Quest, who's obviously built in the form since. And then, with all that form working out, I think the second was, um, or the third was a winner listed company next time out, uh, take no chances. And then, so the form looks strong. I think it, it looks like I'll get these three miles on, a, on the eye. And then I think Patriotic is a good bet. The one thing, the one one I will also have a probably saver on is a Phantom of the Point of David Pipe. Um, Pipe won this with Main Fact a few years ago. It was a generally race over two miles in the majority of his career. And um, I was keen on Phantom of the Points last week at, um, the, in that conditional jockey's race at Cheltenham. It was a non runner on account of self certificate? Probably, I think it was the ground that did him. Um, well, I was going to ask you about that, Matt, because he, they pulled him out on his final start last year on soft ground. Mm. And it's a non-runner self third other. So I just wondered what the what the deal was and uh, whether there yeah, well, was a problem. I, I thought he'd get a uh, good ground. He's, he's out of a Galileo mare and uh, by Mount Nelson. So I thought the good ground would be fine. But um, then after I put him up, I, I saw uh, David's pipe stable tour saying that he's a, he's a chaser for the future and wants soft ground. So I, I do think the ground will be fine. Um, I think the fact that it took him out last week and probably been entering this for a while, I think this is probably the, the ideal target. Um, whether he is classy enough, I'm not too sure, but he's well handicapped in some form last season. Um, and I think stepping up from from generally two to a, uh, I think the last time he went over two mile four, he just jumped out to his right all the time, didn't he? Around, um, I remember his left around Ascot, I think it was. So I think going back around this way now, he can jump to his left. Stepping up the trip, that'll suit as well on this ground. So I'll play uh, Patriotic and uh, Phantom and a point each way. Lovely. So the boys are in agreement there with Patriotic. It's like I say, general 12 to 1 poke, but top price 14 to 1 at the time of recording. And then Matt is going to give Phantom of the points a chance and hope that this time there's not a seltzer putting him out. There's got to be a limit to how many times you can just keep doing that over and over again, isn't there? I don't know what that is. Maybe I'll research it for next week. Anyway, I digress. Let's crack on with some more graded well, I, action. I think, I think you can put you can pull a um, non-runner out for anything because remember that one at Kempton where the owner couldn't get to the track and had been tipped up by New Taylor. It was like 14s into twos or something like that. And uh, 
the conspiracy theorists thought that oh the, the owner didn't get the price so he's got the hump but he's uh, he's refusing to run his horse so yeah basically you can you don't you know you don't really have to give an excuse or you can just you know make up one i've got a doctor's appointment i've left my, left my PE kit at home <laughs> Well, there we go. That's something else to add to my to-do list when I become king of the world or change the rules of everything. <laughs> what I won't change the rules of, though, is the Grade 2 Ascot Hurdle. This is a crack at every single year. Just need to remind all the folk that have probably forgotten, I said that Blue King Drew was the worst priced horse of the entire weekend when he dotted up and won this last year. So that reminds us who last year's winner was. Matt has already alluded to the fact that Golden Ace is running in this race for Jeremy Scott. She comes in after winning the Mayor's Novices Hurdle. Thunder Rock that didn't run in the uh, West Yorkshire Hurdle at Weatherby. We've got Lucky Place that ran so well in a Coral Cup for Nikki Henderson. Salva for the Gary and Josh Moore. And then Colonel Mustard for Mrs. Lorna Fowler. It's a pretty good race. When you look down the history of the winners of this race, like I say, Blue King Daru won it last year. We've had Goshen win it. We've had If the Cap Fits. We've had Song for, uh, Song for Someone when he was a bit younger as well. With Little Rockefeller, Jan Worth, Rock on Ruby. All the way back, you can see Forheen has won this one. So there is typically a good horse that does go and win this one. Only the six runners potentially going to post, Matty, but it looks a pretty decent race, especially on the way that the weight-adjusted ratings would work out. So I'm interested to know how you think this one will pan out. Yeah, I never thought I'd hear a Forheen and Gush in the same sentence, but, but there we go. Um, yeah, as we mentioned with Golden Ace, like she's, she's a remarkable horse. She's by Golden Horn out of uh, a listed one on the flat for John Gosden. But her attitude for her is remarkable. I mean, to think that the uh, the mayor's novice she won at the festival, two subsequent Group 1 winners have come from that race. I don't think it was a fluke by any means. And uh, she has to be respected. And if anything, on that farm, 9 to 4 is a bit lenient. You just have to worry about the yard farm, don't you? I mean, I know that somewhere Daryl Carr is shaking his fist and saying yard farm doesn't matter, which, um, which in title was entitled to her own opinion. And uh, she's already approved against the boys as well. And uh, I just couldn't chance on that yard farm. Uh, Blue Kinderu, I'm not... He won the race last season, beat the subsequent entry, uh, Stayers Hill, win a strong leader. Um, I'm unsure whether this mark of 150 probably flies him a little bit. I know it's not a handicap, but I mean, people will be backing him based on that mark. I'm not sure his rating is quite warranted. Um, lucky places of interest. He was the one that one of the only ones who ran really well for her, Nicky Henderson, at the festival in the Coral Cup, I think it was. Um, I think it was under him and Lu Lucia, maybe. Um, and obviously, the form with Golden Air some earlier on in the season probably puts him quite up there. Uh, the one I'm most keen on, if it does turn soft, is Salva for uh, Gary Moore. Um, only beaten three lengths in the triumph, finished with four lengths behind Targizi, given a seven pound. Who was out? Who was second to Sergino next time out? Then won the champion for your pair at Punchestown. Uh, it's by motivator of a monsoon mayor half going to Saldia. So you'd imagine that it, it'll, it'll improve with uh, with race and with age. And if it's some as well, then at the price, I think he'd be the one for me. Uh, it's two from two when fresh as well. So uh, Salva at the prices for me. At seven to one for Matty to make it back to back four year olds winning the Ascot hurdle. Andrew, I think this is a genuinely fascinating contest to try and pick apart. I think there's pros and cons for most of them in here. Where did your pin land in this one? Well, I find it very puzzling. That's because um, I didn't realize this was one of the televised races. I've uh, rather foolishly looked at the three mile five handicap chase in Ascot. So I've actually done less homework than uh, AP McCoy and Barry Garrity previewing a live. Uh, <laughs> Uh, race at, at entry uh, when they had to ask the cameraman for a selection. So I'm just going to go back there and say, what's that? All right. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> well, obviously Thunder Rock uh, is interested. He's got the small field he likes. You, you look at his record in fields of nine or fewer runners in his career. I think it's nine wins from 15 starts, um, three seconds, two thirds, and a pulled up. Now that pulled up was over fences. And uh, it, it's a funny one over fences. He sort of... Yeah, Occasionally he could look very good, but other times he'd pull out one and get behind and uh, and disappoint. So, uh, given the form, uh, you know, the uh, Ollie Murphy at the yard at the moment, absolutely flying. Sean Burns booting in winners left, right, and centre. He's a course winner as go uh, as well. I'll I'll go Thunder Rock, but I do respect the chances of Colonel Mustard. It's one of these funny ones for the play spot. You've got Golden Ace, wonderful mare, but she's going back against the boys and and the stables out of form. Blue King Daru, we talked about Nichols' um, seasonal debutants of uh, you know are winning about half the rates they would do based normally based on their prices. So it's not impossible you can get the first two of the market out here. You've only got two place pop places to aim for. So I'll probably be looking at sort of Thunder Rock, Lucky Place, Salma, Colonel Mustard, and uh, hoping for an upset. 
Oh, I like it. Everyone's hoping for an upset in this one. And had you have come to the cameraman, which I'm going to say is me for this particular week, I'm going to throw my two penneth in for this one, but it will just be two seconds worth because I, I think Thunder Rock almost has to be a bet in this particular race. Five to one, top price at the time of recording. I gave him a strong mention for that Weatherby hurdle, and I think the race was weak enough that he would have got away with the three miles on quicker ground. They obviously decided not to go there, but he was ready before. Andrew, you've touched on the fact that Ollie Murphy's flying at the moment. So the fact that the horse has been ready and will be coming into here, I think he's fine for that. And we know how good he was as a chaser. He's rated seven pounds lower over hurdles, but hasn't hurdled for a couple of years. Now, he should be a better hurdler than he was back then. I think he can easily run towards the 150s, which on these weight adjusted ratings means that he comes out quite a way clear. The only time he's been around Ascot before was over fences and he slammed solo, I think it was, for, for Paul Nichols. So I think there's a lot of positives in here, especially on the way that the conditions sit for Thunder Rock and the middle, middle trip for him on the ground that's probably going to be ideal as well probably is his preference so while i got the race completely and utterly wrong last year hopefully i'll get redemption this year in the shape of the cameraman selection thunder rock right well, think, yeah rather than get out of jail free cars for races we haven't had time to look at or couldn't be bothered to look at i think we'll have an ask the uh, uh ask the presenter one so we'll, we'll play that one for kate next time she's back I love it. We'll do that as well. We could do an ask the audience and then just have a pause, insert horse's name here. Right, Andrew, this is one of the well, one of the best races of the season. I know that people get excited about Cheltenham Festivals, me more so than any, but first grade one of the season. We have been unfortunately, I want to say spoiled, but spoiled the wrong way around. In in recent years, for the Betfair Chase, sometimes it's been a bit of an anti-climax. Even last year's renewal with Brave Man's game coming here off the back of maybe not coming here, maybe coming here. It just it sort of ruined the race to an extent, but it is a it is a proper, proper grade one. The first British grade one of the season. There's been some phenomenal horses that have won this in the past. There's been loads of multiple winners of this race as well. And of course, we've got Grey Dawn in one of your favourite horses going in here. He's currently head in the market nine to four. Of course, was supposedly going to run in the Charlie Hall. I say supposedly they were going to, the ground wasn't quite right. They took him up to Colin Parker the same weekend as well. So they clearly wanted to get a run into him and they haven't been able to. So he does have to come here fresh. But they did all right with Protector out a couple of years ago coming in here fresh. But then the year after, they did terribly with him coming in fresh. Royal Pagai, that we know he's like a Haydock. He's in second favourite, four to one. Ahoy Senor, who's put up probably back-to-back -back almost career highs with 169 rprs the last couple of runs decent form from that old roan potentially he's third in at six to one capadana that was supplemented is 10 to one hewix 10 to one limerick lace is 12 to one brave man's games 14s the real whackers 14 who did win the charlie hall and then gold tweet i'll have to give him a mention because they pay to enter him 20 to one i don't think he's got absolutely any chance but andrew we need to hand the floor to you because you, you like Grey Dorian, you think he's potentially a Gold Cup horse, that's me putting words in your mouth, but, but how do you see this? It is a grade one, are you still as confident that you can get off to the mark at the start of the season as you were for the Charlie Hall, or are you scared? No, it's first run outside a novice chase company, so that, that would um, concern me. I do love the horse, I fell in love with his attitude a couple of seasons ago, when he won a handicap hurdle at Campton after looking beat, and they did exactly the same thing in the grade two uh, Leamington um, Spa, whatever they call it, um, hurdle when he beat Ginny's Destiny. He, he won by five lengths that day. It was a nine to two shot. You know, you sort of, um, you, you look sort of three or four out. You thought he's not going to be in the first two and he just knuckles down and grinds. And uh, you chuck out his hurdles debut and when he needed the experience, his chase debut when he also needed the run. And then, you know, he was pretty much unbeaten apart from a, a fall behind Apple away at Aintree when uh, Harry Scum was adamant he had her covered and would have won it. And that three quarters of the length to second to Ginny's death near Cheltenham last season, when he's made an absolute horlicks of the second last again, but for which he would have won. So he's obviously won the Turners on soft ground. He's then gone to Aintree. It's probably come a little bit too soon. It's probably a case of um, two and a half miles on a, on a sort of sharp track. Flat track is not ideal. He's a, you know he's a three miler. He won over three miles at Warwick by fourteen lengths uh, back in January of last year. So he's going to take off. You know, I said last year before the Turners that he was my idea of this season's Cheltenham Gold Cup winner. Maybe it's a case of he'll be the best of the British train runners in the Cheltenham Gold Cup and uh, be finishing fit because um, uh, we know how strong the Irish, Irish challenge is going to be. But I think he's he's got um, he's going to have a great season. 
Um, Dan Skelton saying that um, he's more forward than he was for his reappearance last year, which was also his first run of offences. They wouldn't go to a race like this without having him sort of like spot on. I'm not. I'm not so sure. Certainly, if the ground you know turns genuinely heavy, which it might do, uh, at nine or four, two to one, I don't really want to play at that sort of price. I'll just watch him if he wins. So be it. Uh, I've bet two horses each way. One of them is Royal Piggy. Uh, Raw Pagai, sorry, we we know he's, he's very much the, in the Bristol Domain, um, you know, category of Haydock course expert. I think he needs to have, like we have horses on the flat who have split marks for turf and all weather, he should have a split mark for Haydock and everywhere else. And, you know, he's had five runs here, four wins, a second to Aplutard in this race a couple of years ago. He beat Braves Manx game in the race last season. You know, Venetia Williams um, trained. We know she does well in, in the month of November, particularly when the mud's flying. So, uh, yeah, Royal Padai each way. And uh, the other one um, I thought has gone under the radar a bit is Brave Man's Game, who, uh, you know, most people have been disappointed with the late because there's a string of sort of twos in his form figures. But the interesting angle here is that the first time cheek pieces go on, uh, which is quite rare for a, a Paul Nichols chaser. Uh, since 1997, as far back as my database goes, 160 runners from the yard over fences and first time blinkers, 30 winners, profit of £51.85. Only um, in grade ones, he's only run seven, three of them won. And uh, all those who were shorter than 25 to one in the betting all won. Uh, Clando's Lobo at Aintree in 2022 at odds of 13 to 2. Silviano Conti at uh, 2 to 1 at Asphalt in 2016. And uh, um, not marked if you get this one. Seymour Business in the Cheltenham Gold Cup in 1999 was a winner at 16 to 1 in the first time blinkers. Um, and you look at his, I've always said he's not really a spring horse. He's, won, he's run a few good races in the spring, but he tends to go off the boil by that stage of the season. And since he's gone over hurdles or fences, he's had 14 runs from October to February, nine wins, five seconds. And, um, you know, so he, he's got a fantastic record outside the spring period. I think he's going to be second probably to Royal Pagai in this race. So I think each way, I think Skybet were 12 to 1, four places, each way 14 to 1 generally. Um, people say he needs good ground. I don't necessarily buy into that. He's got plenty of form on soft ground. He was second in the race last year to Royal Pagai. Who's to say they won't finish first and second again? So, uh, yeah, I've bet two horses, Royal Pagai and Brave Man's Game. I'll certainly be doing the forecast. I like it. Well, I say I like it. You're, you're definitely a braver man than I am to be back in Brave Man's Game after that last run. But I do take all of it on board. Like you said, with Nichols improving for the runs and that stuff. He did try cheap pieces before, didn't he? And sort of flopped in them as well. Yeah, but... I think I think this is Nichols is something like six from 12 with horses who were having their second run back after a long break, who'd like, you know, run within the last five weeks, including Il Rodoto, you know, last week. Um, so they are improving for that first run. The blinkers, second run after a wind up. There's so many positives. Uh, you know, it, if you're looking at sort of three, you know, three to one a place, top three, that's, uh, that's pretty solid. Absolutely, yeah. And of course, he was sent off favourite for that. Charlie Hall was expected to go a little bit better. And 14 to 1 about a horse like Brave Man's Game in a race like this. He was sent off odds on favourite for it last year, I believe, even though we knew that he probably wasn't 100% in for it, is even sort of semi tempting to me, but not tempting enough. Matty, it's, it's a real decent race. We've got like a good sized field to go out. Andrew's mentioned there's one firm that actually are offering four places up for grabs. We've got nine runners in here as long as they all go to post. How do you see it? Do you think the Grey Dawning can be the first 150s horse since the horse that took advantage of Kelto Stars fall, or do you think he's going to need this as much as we do? Uh, I'm not. Yeah, I, I echo everything what Andrew said. Was yeah. Um, you look at the official ratings of the last ten winners, all between 160 and 174, and um, horses coming out of novice company generally tend to struggle here. Um, for all the horses fresh do win quite often this race. I just think that it'll come on for this run and. Um, maybe something like the king george and, uh, around christmas time and then um, yeah I, I agree with andrew in the sense i do think it'd be very good he'll for short well in a gold cup um but I, in terms of gold cups this is royal kind isn't it he, he won this last season i know we've not seen him uh, since he fell in the cotswold chase um back in january i think it was um but as i say this will be his gold cup season de debut record second a first two seconds another first uh it loves the conditions i just can't, i can't envision Venetian not having him prime for this um brave man's gear i just i don't i wouldn't be as negative than about him than everyone else's i mean i still think he's one of the best jumpers in training i just don't think he stays at the yard above three miles um i think it's his classic got him apart in the gold cups um kempton over three miles not the stiffest of tracks and um the blinkers are an interesting angle if he goes from the front 
Uh, I wouldn't be stepping him up any further than three miles. I think they, they want to give him an entry in the, uh, the national, don't they? What a, what a waste of money that would be. Um, I think he'll show up well here and then work back from the work back to the Ryanair like the like Skelton did with Protector last season. Um, but yeah, I do think Braverman's game will go well. Ahoy Senor, if any, uh, Lucinda also mentioned that they've ironed out something, uh, an issue in his back, didn't they? Um, which is why he's been jumping quite funny. Um, so, and since then, he, he, he showed up so well last time in, uh, in the ball at Aintree behind Jerry Colomb. Um, it's just that he tends to show his form around the spring, doesn't he? I'm not too sure. He's, he's very good this time of year. So, I think the obvious bet for me is Royal Pagai. Uh, and with Andrew and that, I think Brevan's game will show up well as well. Oh, I like it. It's a strong one. We're sort of, I think the market's doing the same, isn't it? Grey Dawning was short, was a bit against it. It's a, it's a deeper bet, fair chase than we're probably expecting. But the boys take it on the favourite, both in agreement that Royal Pagai uh, will go real close, if not win. And Brave Man's game, Andrew's given an actual chance to, but Matty's also given a positive mention for. Right, back to Ascot. We've got a couple of handicaps to close it off, a couple of handicap chases. This one's over two miles, one third on the 320, class two handicap. We saw Matato uh, was actually under Charlie Deutsch last time. Ned Fox takes the rhymes and claims five of the six pounds that he's got up since that win, but he won in quite nice style. It's their dairy that Andrew tipped up at a big price, man really went in between, and Cop Mask was the one that finished third in that particular race. Rhea poses here. Sands Bruitt's not got Bryony Frost on board. Harry Cobden's riding that for Paul Nichols. That'll be his second run after a seasonal reappearance. Marvel de Cerise was with Henry de Bromend, now with Noel George and Amanda Zetter Holm. That horse comes back now off of, a, I think, a significantly higher chase rate in triple trades, trying first-time cheap pieces. There's lots of horses we know bits about, I suppose. It's a good competitive race. But Matty, who wins it? I, I think it's a, a damning indictment of how dire the two-mile chase division is at the moment. I mean, £52,000 a winner, the top weight is off 140. Effectively, 135. Bottom weight off 123. I think 131 has been the, the lowest mark in the last 10 years. And um, it's just a dreadful, dreadful renewal when you consider your likes of Saida Groove, who's won it before, racing it before. And it generally does tend to attract run, runners in the 150s. Um, so I just think it's a complete damning indictment, both the race programme and uh, the level of two mile chases in the UK. But that said, my tata can go well. Um, he won the Burn the Burn handicap last time out, didn't he, Ascot? Um, won it quite causally. Uh, it's been a good, decent prep for this race in recent years. Um, Venetia obviously coming to form now. Uh, but the one I would give a better chance to is Frere Downs, who I put up on my column earlier. Um, second to Boot, half a length second to Boot Hill in it last season. And you think Boot Hill was rated, I think, 155 at the time. And, um, you know, he's a genuine, I know it's a handicap, but Boot Hill turned into a genuine graded chaser. And um, I don't think many of these could, many of these you'd give a good line to finishing course to Boot Hill. I know Frere Downs, he's a bit of a, a bit of a dog, isn't he? But um, he's got a big weight from Matata. He's well, he's chucked in on that form from last season. And um, we saw with uh, Ilva Dotto last week, I mean, these bridesmaids do eventually get their own wedding, don't they? And um, so I, I just think that if they, have him ha if they have him handier this time around as well, and I know Heidi Palin, he, uh, it was eye catching from the rear last time, if they have him handier this time around, and uh, I think he'll go well. Nice. Again, braver man than me to be betting Fred Arms again. <laughs> but the thing is that like this horse against Matata, I think a while back, maybe over hurdles, there's a massive weight swing between these two horses from a long time back. But Andrew, I do think that Matata looks like a pretty improved horse last time out. Deserves to be favourite, do you think? Oh, very much so. I mean, Fred Arms has seen the back end of Marta Tour um, twice and you know, Marta Tour is the, the progressive one and... I don't think anything in here is going to end up in the Queen Mother Champion chase, but if one of them was, you, you'd think uh, he might be the one with an outside chance of making the lineup and being a you know, 50 to 1 shot for it. He's bidding for his fifth straight win. He's got the course form. I, I think he's very solid at around about 11 to 4. Um, I, I thought the um, the Noel George one with James Rivley on was short enough coming over from France. Triple trade was sort of semi interesting in the first time cheap pieces. Uh, if the ground um, didn't ease significantly. Um, Harper's Brook not out of its second run after the wind operation. Uh, I just kept coming back to, uh, you know, Marta Tour and thinking uh, I wouldn't mind backing at 11 to 4. I could see him being 2 to 1 or shorter on the day. Yep, so it's well worth noting that we're recording this on Thursday, around about quarter to three. 11 to 4 top prize, Matato or Matato. Mart Matato. Potato, potato. Potato, potato. Potato, <laughs> but could be a short now. And Fred Arms for Matty is nine to one. But I think at final decks, I opened up about 12. So 
bit of money about for one of them and there's probably gonna be some money about for the other right we close out the nine races with the 340 at haydock three miles one furlong and a half so the same trip as the bet fair chase it's the bet fair exchange handicap chase a naught to 145 and it's actually contested as that. We've got Lemilos as the top weight, 144. So as much as me and Matty like to moan about the standard races, at least this is probably up to standard. Uh, take your time. A last time out winner for Paul Nichols is favourite at the moment, four to one. But that last time out win did come 215 days ago. Credo's in here for Anthony Honeyball and Sam Twist and David. It's been a little bit of money for that horse. Fontaine Collonge as well. There's a, there's a lot of horses, Andrew, that are coming in here that are making their seasonal reappearance but there's plenty that have been seen already this season so do you have preference for one side or the other do you want to be with one that's been seen out or do you want one that's coming here off of a layoff uh i'll go with the layoff angle that's fontaine Collange for venetia williams been off the track 315 days venetia november handicap chases um blah 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 i've been banging on about that for about 20 years now so uh, uh, that that's the angle for me. Um, take your time. Might need it. Nichols runner up making its seasonal debut. Lamilos um, was interesting because I, I thought the obvious race for him would be the old Hennessy, uh, the Coral Gold Cup handicap chase at Newbury at the end of this month. The race because that he's um, he run so well in previously, but it's uh, interesting that he's not even entered for that. He's coming here. Uh, Hititi. He did finish second on his comeback, but I, I still think he's best in the spring. And uh, I thought he's the kind of horse you don't mind backing each way at a massive price, but you know, not at single figures. Uh, my silver lining was very strongly backed at Wing Canton on his comeback last month for the race he'd won the previous season uh, on his reappearance, but he completely bombed out, was reportedly never travelling. It's interesting that, interesting that this one's been back from 14s into 10s. I could see her doing uh, better. Uh, Pepe Lamoco, I'm still not sure about the trip for this one, but he'll improve for his comeback effort. And Prairie Wolf's one I've got my eye on for the uh, uh, the Catterick race in January that he's won for the last couple of years. And uh, he's, he's he's got a great record in January, February time. So, uh, yeah, so stick him in your trackers and, you know, hopefully he'll just get around finishing sort of fourth, fifth or sixth and we can back him then. But uh, for this race, it's got to be Fontaine Collage for me. I like it. Matty, I've just given a strong mention to a few in there, potentially a future sites or uh, sort of future targets down the line. What do you see for this 340? Who do you think wins this particular race? Uh, yeah, I'm glad Andrew mentioned uh, Prairie Wolf. I, I don't think this this will be the target. will be, as ever with Snoop, Sue Smith runners, um, well, Joel Parkinson's on the on the, uh, on the the license now. I think Harvey Smith's grandson is uh, Joel Parkinson. Um, obviously, with, uh, with Sue Smith. So I think the yards runners, I mean, they, I, 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 live, I used to live quite close to yards. I've always followed them, and I always make the mistake every single time of backing them out of uh, out, out of sentiment in like October, November time. And you just do your conquers, don't you? You've got to wait for January and uh, January, February time. That's when they come good. And um, so, as Andrew mentioned, wait for Prairie Wolf till uh, around January time. And then um, that's echoed a great basic all of the runners now. Um, Monday Genius is interesting. He's got an, an, an entry in the Hennessy, hasn't he? Uh, next week, a race that he was uh, third in a couple of years ago. Um, might even been last year to that's all right, Gino. Um, sent off uh, well, favourite for the uh, ultimate uh, behind Cork Rambler. I know that he's completely gone off the boil, but for Mark of 144, if they kind of spin him around here, it could be somebody, it could be a decent price for the, uh, for the old Hennessy. I think he's around 25 to 1. Wouldn't be expecting him to win first time out, but it might just be for, uh, one for next week. Um, I thought Credo was was the, the starting point, uh, second in this uh, off two pounds higher last season and uh, made it okay. Well, it was, he'd been at seven to four when Canton last time out, uh, but the ground was probably lively, lively enough for it. Um, but I'd imagine this would have been the target. Uh, so, Credo for me, uh, a decent price of eight to one. I like it. So, Credo for Matty, uh, eight to one, and it was Fontaine Collange for Venetia, Charlie Deutsch, and Andrew Mount at seven to one. Right, gentlemen, we've had quite a lot to cover in there. There is still some decent racing across the rest of the weekend. So, Matty, was there anything from you for any, from anywhere else? Uh, not from anywhere else, no, but it's worth mentioning. Uh, we're watching that Ballyburn chase debut, isn't it? Uh, it could be anything this season. Absolutely. Andrew, did you get time to look at anything from anywhere else? Yeah, well, having looked at the 205 at Ascot, the three mile, five furlong handicap chase, I ought to mention uh, uh, the, the, the ones I was looking at there. Particularly interested in Fortescue for Henry Daly. Um, he's got a fantastic record in chases of 11 or fewer runners um, 17 runs, six wins, seven seconds, um, three thirds and a fourth, and a, a seventh, and a field of sort of 17, 18 runners, I think it was at Sandow. So uh, four to skew each way or place only in that 205 at Ascot. 
I haven't seen any prices yet. I like it. So we've given us given the viewers 10 races to get stuck into this weekend. Right, Andrew, I'm going to give you some warning. I will be asking you for a nap, but Matty... Oh, I, you pulled that one out the fire, didn't you? <laughs> as we oh, brought you back, that. Matty, I'm going to let you let you have first crack at the nap for this weekend. Who's your best bet of the ITV races we've covered, or is it coming elsewhere? I'd, I'd probably go Royal Pagai, um without the risk of stealing what, what might be Andrew's. Uh, Royal Pagai, and I'll give my next best to be Don Zavon uh, in the 115 at Haydock. Nap and the next best. Right, Andrew, you can give a nap and the next best if you want, or just the nap, please. Well, I'll go nap 2.30, the Stairs Handicap Hurdle. That's uh, patriotic for Evan Williams. And, uh, yeah, next best would be Royal, the Royal Piggy um, Brave Man's Game straight forecast. Excellent. Well, viewers out there, you'll be pleased to know that the Nap and Next Best is not a regular feature, but who knows it might be. But we've got some good selections in there. Andrew and uh, Matty were both in agreement with Patriotic and Royal Pagai, and they've made it as the Naps and Next Best for this week. So thank you so much for tuning in and taking the time if you've managed to last this long. Best of luck with your bets if you follow us in this weekend, or even if you don't. And we will see you again next week. <laughs> <laughs>